Okay, welcome back. Thanks for tuning in. Um, this could be a crazy video today. And the reason why is because what I'm going to try to explain ties into a video I did nine months ago about a dream I had that I never expected to have like a um, any kind of resolution to. First of all, let me apologize because I have um, a Christmas cold. I caught on Christmas Eve, which is wonderful. So... Yes, I'm sniffly. I'm always sniffly because I'm an allergy nightmare, but um, I'm extra sniffly, so I apologize. I'm so sorry. Um, I do feel better, though, um, on this third day. It's getting there. It's a pretty mild cold, but still annoying, you know, because I miss Christmas again with my family. I missed last year because Buffalo had a massive snowstorm, and um, we couldn't travel for two days here, which is really unusual. I mean, sometimes a snowstorm will shut us down for a few hours but this one was a biggie and it was pretty dramatic anyway that's not the subject of today's video <sighs> where to begin okay first let me say <laughs> i am um, i have slipped into reading a dolores cannon book i've never read a dolores cannon book before shay's here next to me i don't know if he's visible there he is say hi I've never read any Dolores Cannon before, and um, I've occasionally come across a video of her on YouTube, and I wasn't sure what I thought. There was something maybe about her speaking style seemed a little bit, um, I don't know, about bossy or didactic, and that that's uh, that's such a that can really be a turnoff when you're when you're into spiritual stuff. Now it could have been just that day, that one video that I saw, but it seemed like she was lecturing in a way that. Um, didn't quite appeal to me, but I watched a different video about her a few nights ago, and uh, I thought it was kind of interesting, so I sort of randomly picked a book of hers to peruse, and um, I have been reading it pretty um, quickly the last few days while I've been sick, so it's been a good, um, good distraction from being sick. Um, the book, the book is called The Convoluted Universe, book one. So I guess she did a whole series of these. There are at least four or five, I think. Um, it's not a great, that's not a great title for a book. <laughs> I mean, no offense, Dolores, but um, The Convoluted Universe um, sounds like the confusing universe or the chaotic universe, which is not necessarily untrue. It's just, um, it's not as inviting as maybe it could be. Um, I don't know what the better description is. Maybe the, I don't know, the dramatic universe or the wondrously, the wonder, wonderful chaotic universe or the wonderfully convoluted universe. You know, those are actually awful too, but um, <laughs> you get my point. So the book is a series of interviews with people that she meets along the way in her life. And the book was written, oh, sugar, I think in the 90s or maybe early 2000s. She lived until, I think, 2014, um, lived to be uh, a fairly old woman um, at that time. So she did a lot of her writing, in the, I think, in the 80s and the 90s. But I don't know her whole history, so forgive me on that. The book is interviews with um, people who um, can remember their past lives under what they call regression hypnosis, which um, there are some current regression hypnosis practitioners that I'm aware of in this kind of um, YouTube spiritualist community like Dave Johnson, I guess, is one. And Kim Carey and I were talking about him on her channel, and I, I, I would like to reach out to him and see if I can get a reading about maybe my my past lives sometime soon, because I think that will be part of the next book I'd like to write. And I think maybe, I'm not sure if Sterling Psychic Medium also does them too. They're not the only ones. There are others. Those are just the ones that come to mind. So anyway, Dolores Cannon does these series of interviews with people who at least for this purposes of this book, um, remember living in Atlantis, which is the r rumored um, lost city at the bottom of 
the Atlantic Ocean and um, you know take it take it for what it's worth but in the book these these people that she's interviewing multiple different people who lived during the time of Atlantis which I guess lasted many years like maybe even thousands of years Atlantis existed as kind of an island nation in what is now the Atlantic Ocean and uh, the tale of Atlanta, Atlantis in the shortest possible version of my town um, for the purposes of this video is that they were according to the book and the interviewees a super advanced civilization that learned how to manipulate energy with their minds they could apparently they learned to levitate in time they learned telepathy they were able to construct their buildings with the power of collective group thought they they pulled people together to move objects using their minds and using sound waves um which are which is pretty wild sometimes amplified by crystals which can um, magnify amplify energy when you shoot energy through a prism you, it can be magnified um, and um, they learned about the power storage capabilities of crystals their entire it seems like their entire um, energy system was based on using solar energy to power crystals which then in turn powered everything they needed in their civilization like like literally um, they discovered that you could um, that there were crystals that look like stone that you could solar charge and use for heating in residences and you could also use them as light sources so this supposedly Atlantis had no need for electricity because um, they had learned how to master storage of solar energy and um, the moon energy as well which is said to have different qualities and they achieve such a degree of mental acuity advanced mental ability that um, they could even the, collectively in groups they they could rearrange matter at the atomic level it's hard to believe but it's a pretty wild universe they learned how to like say for instance when they if they were building a structure like a building or um, say well they didn't I don't I don't think there's any reference to them building pyramids but it seems like some of the ancestors of Atlantis may have been responsible for building the pyramids pyramids in Egypt and that <laughs> There are references in the book to how they could actually, two things, they could actually shape stone with their minds into large stones into the shapes they wanted so that, so that, and then they could levitate them to stack them and to like build structures, like just buildings themselves, but also, um, you know, later pyramids in Egypt um, with their descendants, the people who survived the destruction of Atlantis um, and um, there's so much in it I, I just can't do it justice and again you know not <coughs> excuse me I don't know for sure how much of it is true if, if it's all true if, if it's only part true but it's an intriguing intriguing read even if you want to treat it as science fiction um, but I'll get to my point soon how it ties into the dream I had nine months ago. This this was the part that really surprised me. So, yeah, and apparently, like, they could even, um, if they didn't have a stone, a type of stone that they needed for a project, they could actually manifest it into existence with the power of collective thought. That's really hard to grasp. But again, who knows how powerful we, we really are. And it's my coffee maker going off. Apparently, the ability to levitate 
and to not have to rely on like heavy machinery and electricity and all these things that we have in our current civilization was um, observed by alien races and considered a, a high achievement that not even most or all alien races had been able to achieve. Like most alien races had evolved the way we're evolving now along tech technological lines where the technology just becomes more and more advanced to where it it, it does the, the job um, you know it does these sort of futuristic jobs for us um, including space travel so yeah and oh it's right like there are there are references in in Dolores's book about these um, crystal energy sources that are kind of like um, they emit beams of energy all around the city of Atlantis, the city island of Atlantis, like a grid, so that their buses and cars um, don't even have wheels. They they levitate. They they're able to feed on the energy that's being put out by the crystals, and basically, it's like a through it's like a throughway system. It's like a levitating throughway system. You you. You orient your vehicle, your bus, your car, whatever, towards the energy beam, and the beam catches you, and you ride the beam. And the energy is limitless because it's all coming from the sun and powered through the crystals. Crazy. Super interesting. Um, so, but what happens is, to take a long shortcut, short, long cut, long short. <laughs> It's such a cautionary tale. It's such an old tale. The 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 powers that the abilities that they acquire in this civilization eventually corrupt many of the people in power. They begin to use them for the wrong purposes. They begin experiments with um, like genetic experiments with animals and with people um they um they they engage in manipulation of others through their mental powers and apparently outside of the city of atlantis the rest of the world is less advanced so they begin to look down on those who are not at their level of um you know, a, a achievement, and um, they begin to look at themselves as gods. And the story that's told in the book is that what destroys them is that once the power, once the government is essentially corrupted, um, they are aware that their island nation exists along fault lines in... Um, you know, in the in what is now the Atlantic Ocean, and in their arrogance and their hubris, they believe that they can um, correct correct the like the tectonic plates by using their most powerful crystal and their minds. <laughs> this is so out there to um, bore down into the center of the Earth and control like rearrange the tectonic plates or rearrange um, the bedrock so that um, they can prevent this um, apparent forthcoming um, like earthquake that will damage but not necessarily destroy Atlantis. But they end up boring so far down into the into the earth into the mantle that they essentially tap the magma that is at the core of the earth and it is a it results in a catastrophic explosion they basically made it 10 times or 100 times worse than it would have been because when they hit the magma the magma literally just exploded it exploded Atlantis, um, rivers of lava, um, tsunami waves of water, and 
it was literally decimated. The island was literally decimated. And the book claims that it didn't actually sink to the bottom of the the ocean around it, but it it sunk. It sunk enough that it became um, a dangerous area for ships to travel because um, you could literally be uh, sailing the ocean up to and around Atlantis and literally like kind of hit a cliff edge. And so this may be where stories about um, the end of the war, you know, the end of the world that they worried about in those days when they thought the world was flat, that you could sail to the end of the world and fall off the edge of the world. That might be literally true in this sense because uh, there was a chasm where Atlantis um, slipped so let's say it's 50 feet 50 feet below sea level it it's it did sink but it didn't it didn't yet sink into the bottom of the ocean though eventually it did um because apparently it sounds like from the this reading that Atlantis existed maybe 12,000 years ago and so there have been subsequent generation you know subsequent civilizations around this is long before the Romans and the Greeks that have existed after them and um, that have also fallen. Um, so the, the Atlantis is sort of buried beneath multiple civilizations that are at the bottom of the ocean. It's, it's essentially completely destroyed, and that's what makes it impossible to find. Though the book claims that in this time frame... In, our, in the current era that we're in, as we approach another kind of uh, tipping point in civilization due to social and political unrest and also global climate change, that there's a, a prophecy in the book that... Um, how did they put it? that some of the, the room, well, for lack of a better description, some of the ruins of Atlantis will actually be rediscovered. Um, and that's where my dream kind of ties in. And also, like, it's said that um, there were some scientists who lived in Atlantis before it was destroyed, before they destroyed themselves, who warned that that this destruction would happen if if people tampered with trying to manipulate the earth in this way. And they left. And supposedly their their ancestors took with them a lot of this knowledge of how to manipulate matter at the atomic level and how to how to levitate themselves and objects and that they were that their eventual descendants were the ones who created the pyramids in Egypt and that the pyramids themselves are energy sources that um, are actually oriented towards the heavens in such a way that they're like a signal to the universe to other species that humanity had has had achieved a certain degree of um, knowledge, and not only that, but they, it says in the book that they were so advanced in their mental telepathy and their techniques that they were able to communicate with people on other planets by thought, and and that these thoughts could be enhanced by the crystals that they had. They could send, they could communicate with other species at great distances using crystal technology and their power, of their minds. And then, as I said, these people who who fled Atlantis before it sunk took some of this sacred knowledge with them to Egypt, and this resulted in the construction of the pyramids in Egypt using the same techniques, mental techniques of levitating stone and creating stone and shaping stone. I mean, it all sounds like such a... It all sounds crazy, but... It's very fun to read about. Um, 
the part of me that has seen enough crazy stuff in this lifetime is inclined to believe believe it to some extent to an extent that I'm not even sure of but maybe I'll get more confirmations of what I'm reading if I keep going so I'm definitely I'm definitely my attention is definitely captured so let me try to get to where my dream ties in this really surprised me when I came across and I came across it late before I went to bed because the book was keeping me up and and I had the luxury of knowing that I wasn't going to be going to work today um, so I could read a little later than I normally would. Um, so I get to this part in the book that says that, as I mentioned, this this period of time is seen as another kind of... Um, tipping point this is a this is a this is a moment in history where humanity is starting to approach some of the some of the dangers of, of Atlantis because our knowledge our techno our technology is grow is is evolving at such a quick rate and our knowledge of things is evolving so fast that we are in danger of overstepping um, overstepping some bounds we could we could we could wreck ourselves too if we're not careful even though we're not as mentally like psychically advanced as supposedly um, Atlantis was so what one of the people who's interviewed by Dolores says is that as we approach this new um, tipping point on earth some of the knowledge of Atlantis and knowledge contained in the pyramids, which can still be tapped apparently if you, if we knew how, if we were, if we were a little more advanced, um, spiritually and mentally, we, we would be able to decipher some of the secrets of Egypt and, and uh, of the Egyptian pyramids and rediscover, some of the abilities that were lost with Atlantis as as we near um, this knowledge um, some some of this knowledge is going to bubble up and be available to what the person referred to as the foundation generation the foundation generation and there's no further detail given about the foundation generation but Here's the kicker for me. I hope I explained this well. Nine months ago, and I'm going to link the video um, from nine months ago below this one if you want to watch it. And it starts about midway through the video. I had a dream about approaching a tower of great sacred knowledge, like powerful knowledge about reality. And um, and I just watched a bit of the video myself to re-familiarize myself. And... In the dream, I realized that as you as you went to higher levels of the building, there was more and more sacred knowledge, and it was um, there were fewer and fewer people who were um, entitled to sort of reach reach for that knowledge because you had to have the right intent, and um, the lower levels of the building were filled with like classrooms for children. Um, and then it just kept leveling up until you got to kind of like the what I believe in the in the dream I refer to as the um, wisdom nerds. There's a level at which there are wisdom nerds, and there's not a lot of them. And they um, they were actually on the outside of the building. And in the in the dream, I described that in the dream I had to not only like get all the way up to the top of this building but then i had to like step outside of the building scale um scale the lip of the building and step onto a uh, a slanted roof that contained a large obelisk and that some of these uh wisdom nerds were sitting on the roof um in their own daydreams not really even paying attention to me and when i approached the obelisk it's 
surface was um, transparent and I stepped right through it. And when I stepped through it, it was an enormous space, like an infinite space in all directions. And I was welcomed into the space by these loving, invisible arms that held me and said something like, uh, welcome, lonely, lonely traveler, lonely seeker of knowledge, because it was implied that not a lot of people would maybe get to this level of, of, um, of knowledge. Um, not, not to say that other people, like there may be people in this viewing audience who, um, are, are, you know, equally, um, worthy. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm even worthy. I don't even really know, but in the dream I was. And so I step in and they welcome me and, you know, welcome. And then they said, then they say, this is the part that baffled me. Welcome to the foundation. Welcome to the foundation. And I didn't know what that meant. So I had this dream nine months ago. And then in the Dolores Cannon book I'm reading last night, there's a person who was in Atlantis who says we're at the next tipping point and that some of the secrets of um, this advanced civilization are just starting to peak up again and become known to the foundation generation, which I'm going to interpret as maybe thinking of a foundation as the 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 you know the the base upon which you build a structure maybe the current light workers who are on planet earth right now some of them or all of them are the foundation generation maybe maybe the people who are here now are going to be the first to tap into these this sacred knowledge that has to do with that is oriented around truth. That was that was something in the book that was really um, really struck me. How there is a part in the book where they say that truth is built into the fabric of of existence, into of the fabric of reality. It's not a it's not a subjective thing. It's not. Um, it's not it's inherent to itself like so if if we are truthful then we're aligning with with something that is sacred um with, we're aligning with sacred truth and when we lie and and we deceive and we go against what is true like as is is really playing out in our politics right now where like lying has become um, infectious and people are trying to get away with corrupt and terrible actions simply by maintaining a lie the the book is adamant that this is this is a destructive path truth itself can't be destroyed because it is a reality within itself it is inherent to itself but when a society becomes misaligned from truth, there's some danger there because it allows other bad things to happen. It's, it's, it ripples the energies, the energy, the toxic energy kind of, kind of like infects more people. It, it travels throughout the entire culture. And it seems that this is what's playing out now. It's not, there's, there's a lot of global corruption. I mean, if you, look at any nation that is not free like China or Russia which are dictatorships that those are based entirely on untruth so they are already so misaligned with what the purpose of the universe is and the purpose of the creator or the all or the one or the, or god whatever you, whatever term you prefer that um, there's danger in in that energy um having too much of an upper hand globally and so the idea as i understand it is that that is what the light workers here are for and i believe that it was dolores cannon even though it's not in this book 
who was the first um, sort of spiritualist writer to describe um, the plan, meaning that light workers would come from other star systems um, or they would be advanced beings who had had many incarnations on earth, that there was a group collective effort that began essentially a par, a, a, around the 1960s in, um, in the Western world to bring back the values of, bring back enlightenment values. And that the first wave of this was um, the baby boomers, you know, the, the hippie generation among the baby boomers. And then followed by the second wave of Gen X and, and the third wave of millennia, millennia, millennials and so on, such that um, now there is there's tens of thousands or maybe even millions or hundreds of thousands or millions of light workers on Earth um, whose purpose, your purpose, in my opinion, my purpose, in, in my opinion, is to contribute to the light on Earth at this time. And that's why... Um, I keep up my prayers. I pray daily for um, that the world be wrapped in light, that the world be in protected, um, that the world be um, enveloped in the pure white light of the Creator, and that my own actions and um, thoughts are more harmonious and um, more love-based and less fear-based. You know, we're we're human. We we we. We tend to be judgmental, but trying to cut down on judgment as much as you can, um, not live from jealousy um, or anger or hatred, these things that are destructive and only only sort of help the other side. So um, I'm by no means perfect. I say it all the time, but um, I do see how prayers have a powerful effect I, I'm sure that I mentioned in my last video, I think I did, I know I did on Kim's show, that we've been conducting some prayer experiments in our family. I've been praying for people to sleep better. I try to remember to do it every night. Sometimes I'm a little late to do it if I happen to go to bed late. But um, but the people that I've been praying for, including my mom and my brother, do say that they've been sleeping better. My mom said she had the best night of sleep she's had in ages. Um, and... Um, I had given her two days before Christmas, we were together and had dinner and, um, I gave her some flowers, her birthday's on Christmas, but I gave her the flowers early and some hot cocoa that she really likes this really high quality cocoa from the co-op, um, we have here in Buffalo. And, um, she said she had a glass before bed and she slept from 10 until seven, which never happens. And she was out cold. I, I, I can't remember the last time my mom ever said she slept nine hours. Half the time she's going to bed at nine and waking up all night and getting up at four in the morning, which like I just don't even, that doesn't even make sense to me. I would not even be functional, but she's, uh, she's kind of amazing that way. So been putting out those prayers like that they sleep better, trying to envelop them in warm, warm, calming energy. And going back to Atlantis, Let's say for for a moment that everything in the book is true, that the people of Atlantis discovered that thoughts and prayers were so powerful that they could they could really truly manifest enormous enormously um beneficial things for their society, that they could actually like construct a society with the power of their thoughts. And what if we don't realize how powerful we are? We sell ourselves short just too often, including me, and we don't em embrace that aspect of our abilities. And the universe, especially the creator, and especially at this time on Earth, really wants us to embrace the positive aspects of, of manifestation of thoughts and prayers, which are essentially the same thing, in my opinion, of putting out that energy, that good energy, as often as you can, whether it's in meditative prayer or in your daily interactions with people. Believe me, 
there are people in my life who like there are people I work with who drive me nuts. Like it takes it takes all my effort not to like, you know, lose it sometimes with a few of the people that I work with. So since I don't feel super loving towards these people, I'm at least trying not to wish them ill and I'm trying to moderate my responses to people who really tweak my nerves. And so if that's if that's an improvement I can make within myself and keep a better lid on my response to things I don't like to hear from certain people, then then that's at least an improvement. And, you know, you can practice that. And the more you do it, the more you realize you can do it and that you don't need to, like, necessarily always have your say or be right or be heard. You, you can you can suck it up sometimes and it doesn't do you any harm. In fact, it does you a lot of good um, to not lose your focus, to stay clean in your mind and your intent. And so that's my message today that um, maybe we are that powerful. According to this book, we are. It's there. The abilities are are latent. They're waiting to be rediscovered. And we, the people watching this, this, this kind of wider spiritualist community on YouTube, um, we may be the foundation generation that's referred to in the book, which still blows my mind because that dream was nine months ago. So again, one more time in the dream, when I scaled the building and I got to the top, I passed through the front of the obelisk and they said, welcome to the foundation. And I didn't have any idea what it meant. And now I think I do. That's so weird. <laughs> it, it does give me chills because it's such a long payoff, you know, for the dream, to, which I never thought there would be any follow-up to. Whew. That's, how, that's how wild things are. Synchronistic and strange. Interestingly strange. So that's what I have for today. Um, again, the book that I'm reading by Dolores Cannon is The Convoluted Universe, book one. I have been skipping around a little bit. I think I think the Atlantis stuff that I'm referring to is more like chapter six and seven. I think I started on chapter two. I have a bad habit of doing this with books. I jump in a couple chapters in and I skip around and then sometimes I go back and I start reading from the beginning again. I don't read books in order anymore. I mean, or like I do after I've skipped around a bit. It satisfies my curiosity, I guess. Or it'll, it tells me if I really want to read the rest of the book. So, uh, yeah. I would love to know your thoughts. If you have any further thoughts about the foundation generation or, and it's not in quotes in the book, it just passes right by real quick. It's mentioned just like in passing by this person, the foundation generation, and who says, you know, it takes a foundation to start, to start the next, you know, wave of uh, whatever, of uh, spiritual growth. So, but if you've heard more about the foundation generation, either in a Dolores Cannon, another Dolores Cannon book, or, um, or elsewhere, I would love to know because this is a new concept to me. And, um, yeah, I'm still kind of processing it. Okay, I'm going to cut this one off here. Be well. Hope you had a great holiday if you celebrate. Um, hope you didn't get a cold like me. I'm fine. And um, I'll talk to you again soon. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.